this is a topic on gifted children, although I always list it as bright and gifted. And the reason for that is, uh, typically today, you know, if you send your child to a public school, or if you want to get them into some special program, you take an IQ test, and the cutoff is 130, which puts them in about the top one and a half to two percent of the population. But actually, history says the people who end up leading the country, leading the economic moves, leading education, leading the science, really the IQs are more like 120 and up. For example, John F. Kennedy had an IQ of 123. He would have never gotten into a gifted program, but I think he turned out pretty smart. Um, and so I like to define it that way because there's a lot more features to somebody being gifted and bringing that gift to fruition than just their IQ score. And so, um, I, personally, I even drop the score down to about 115 when I'm working with kids. Because you can tell a lot more by uh, working with them, see what potential there is, and then bring out that potential. And sometimes you're surprised. I go back and I look at their records from entrance and I find out he's nowhere near gifted. How, where, you know, where did he get that? <laughs> the capacity. Um, because it's just not that cut and dry. So that's the kind of, that's the population I'm talking about. Um, and, and, and it's helpful in, in the kind of setting that we have at Birchwood, and just in general, um, because the features that will develop your kid's talent are much more than an IQ score. It's good to know. Um, sometimes it works the other way. I find out a child struggling a little bit, go back and look at his records, and he's got 150 IQ. And I realize we're missing something here. Let's go back to the drawing board and figure out what to do. Okay, so what I'll do is I get some uh, broad ideas about educating bright and gifted kids and maybe trigger some thoughts that you have and some questions. And I, I hope it's profitable. Um, I've been at this for since the mid-70s. Uh, so got an interest in gifted ed before it was popular because I was teaching uh, elementary school and I, was, I had very, a handful of very, very bright kids. Uh, at that point, second grade. I tried to teach them third grade math, then fourth grade math, then some fifth grade math, and then the administration came down on me. Because the teachers were saying, if you teach them third grade math, what is the third grade teacher going to do next year? I said, okay, so you want me to teach them nothing? Yes, or at least do other things. Just don't accelerate them. That was the, and so that, that started to get me interest, uh, interested in the field. Um, Back at that time, I've been at it now for uh, well over 30 years, working in different capacities, working with bright and gifted kids. So a lot of what I'm going to share with you is come, does come from the research. I'm, I'm pretty well read in that. Um, some from history, and a lot just from my own experience, and what we've tried to do here at Birchwood. So let me tell you first why, why we educate bright and gifted kids. Number one, uh, for any human being to feel fulfilled, satisfied, You've got to bring your skills and talents as far as they will go. Probably if you're like me, there's a few things you might look back on and say, I wish somebody would have pushed me in that area. Gosh, you know, I've got some potential to do this. I wish I would have had this opportunity. Um, but you fall short, so there's something inside of you that just says, gosh, I wish there was a little bit more there. You know, you feel that way. So from a personal standpoint, when you look at your own children, I'm sure nobody wants to raise their kids and have them think, gosh, I wish my mom and dad would have done this for me. Uh, so when there's potential, if you don't develop that potential, long term, you frustrate your children. Because they're not becoming what their, their capacity can become. So you always feel a little bit of lack. The second reason is, is bigger. It, I, I, I think, and there is some literature on this, the, uh, the national um, necessity and need of developing the talents of our brightest. Whether they get a good education or a bad education, they will lead the country. That's just history. The brighter ones go to the top. Now, who goes to the top has a lot to do with how well the country turns out. You get young people who are well-educated, as well-educated as anyone in the world. And right now, that's a big issue, that the level of our bright children is on is uh, commensurate with what you can get anywhere in the world. The second feature, which I'll talk about a little bit later, is that we raise children to become wise. This is critical, especially in our day and age. 
Sometimes we, we can accelerate children's learning, but that doesn't mean they're learning the capacity to be true leaders. Leaders who are wise, who have a broad perspective on what they bring to the table in their decision-making process. Okay, so that's number one. Then number two, if you can understand this thought, you, you'll have a good grasp on what to do for your children. When you talk about giftedness with children, it is gifted potential. It is gifted potential. But what does that tell you? It tells you it's, it's got to be developed. Just like a, a, I used to coach, and you know, very, very frequently you'd, you'd uh, comment, boy, that kid's got a good arm. That kid's, he's, he can really become a good pitcher. But he never worked on it, never developed it, never, never took care of himself. And so guess what? That giftedness of being a pitcher or that giftedness of being a quarterback, it never got developed. It was there. They had the potential, but it never got developed. And this is critical in, in our conversation about giftedness because today, a little bit, sometimes a label is put on a child who's identified as gifted, as if it's a special species. They're gifted. Well, this is gifted. So they need a gifted program. But my challenge always back to that is, yes, they're gifted. But gifted what? That gift will be recognized as a gift as it develops. So if they have the propensity for uh, mathematics or for writing or for science, what has to happen? They have to be given opportunities, a playing field, where whatever they have within can be developed to its fullest capacity. And it, that needs training. And, and, I'll, and I'll talk a little bit in detail. You know, sports has learned this. The music field has learned this. You know, they'll say this is a, a prodigy a, a pianist. They didn't go that far. Well, you can, you can say they had the gifted potential, but nobody would call that person a gifted pianist because it hasn't been developed. Okay, and that's, that would be a key topic tonight because that's what I'm talking about. We're not just saying things we can do with gifted children. There's all kinds of things you can do with them. We're talking about taking their capacity, their intellectual capacity, and bringing it to a point where they're fulfilled and that it comes to fruition where it's recognized by people in mathematics and say, boy, that kid knows his math, or that is a, that's a scientist, mm -hmm. or that's an engineer, because of demonstrated performance in, in a respective domain. Okay, the third point, the most important player in the developing talent and gifted children is mom and dad. Schools are helpful. I think, I think Bertrand's a great school. We can do a lot of, a lot of collaboration with parents because I do think we know what we're doing. We've been doing this a long time. Nevertheless, I will never know your child like you know them. And unfortunately, I'm not going to care for your child like you do. It is mom and dad. And there's lots of research to back this up. Mom and dad who are realize my child has this kind of potential, intellectual potential. And then to have a careful eye on it, on how it's being developed, is it being developed, are they thriving as a learner? That's often, you know, I've probably said that to you a few times. How do you know whether your child's adequately challenged? They're thriving. Dad, I love math. Dad, I love to read. Okay, you, you're, you're seeing this potential starting to have a little blossom. You know, that's what thriving is. Uh, the, they're, they're sensing some development, some competency, and they're just happy. That's a neat thing about kids, just like any, any human being. You grow in something, you feel wonderful. So what happens to a child who has the capacity to be a good writer or a good mathematician? Give them a chance. Let them go as far as they can. What happens? They shine. And of course, when it's not, who usually notices it first? Mom or dad? Come home. I don't like school. That should be a big red flag. You know, that you need to talk to the teacher, you need to talk to the school. You need, you're watching all the time. I'm sure you do this when you're thinking about, you know, should, what kind of opportunities to give them in the summer. You know, should we go, go down to the uh, science center and they've got some programs there or out to the metro park? You're looking because you're developing talent. Nobody's going to do it like mom and dad. And tonight what I want to do is just give you a few tools on what you want to look for in high-end academics, because that's the talent we're talking about tonight. We're not talking about baseball or football or golf. 
Then I would have another kind of lecture, who you go to, where you go, what kind of training. This is for cognitive, to, cognitive development. Okay, so because we're talking about uh, cognitive giftedness, we want to talk about academic programming. So that, in a sense, you're giving them a feel. That's what a good school does. That's what any tutors you bring on uh, do, is they create this field to play in. You know, when I was a, uh, I don't know if you're much of a baseball fan, I, I love sports. And, you know, the major leagues today, baseball, has a preponderance of young talent from Central America, from the Caribbean, from South America. And do you know why? Is it just that, you know, uh, Hispanics from Central America and, and the Caribbean and South America are just naturally born baseball players? They're not. And they tend not to have the financial support that America has for its baseball player. Then why the preponderance? Day one, you don't have much, you go out with a stick, you go out with a stone, and you play all day. Your mom rolls up a burrito or something for you and says, don't come back until the sun goes down. Well, those kids get such a huge advantage in playing. And so, if there is talent, then those who have talent, it really blossoms and it comes forth. And it shows. I, I remember, I, I give this illustration often. Do you remember the chess matches between uh, Bobby Fischer and Boris Spassky? Maybe you don't, I don't know. I might get a lot older than everybody. <laughs> you may remember. <laughs> <laughs> No offense. Uh, well, you know, this did cause a big problem because, you know, Bobby Fischer was the only master chess player in the United States. But Boris Spassky, he was one of hundreds from Russia. So, you know, the pundits begin wondering what, you know, what is this? Are Russians just more analytical? Are they smarter? They get better training? You know, they were pondering this. Well, eventually it turns up a while later when they did some analysis from first grade all the way through elementary school, high school, college, you study chess every single day. You have a chess class. Well, guess who produces a lot of chess players? Russia. It had nothing to do with uh, raw intelligence. It had everything to do with opportunity. And because that opportunity was there, then the talent blossomed. And so that's what uh, you want to see happen with their academics. They got a field to play on. That was their field, chess every day in elementary and middle school. And you get to play it, and by golly, if you have the potential, it's going to come out. Now, did they get other opportunities, like to have uh, uh, discussions about literature that challenged authority? Probably not. They probably didn't get that kind of training at that period of time in, in Soviet Russia. Uh, so, you're, you're, get the academic program you want in schooling, or you do tutoring, or whatever you do with your children, you're creating that field to practice on. So there's a few things to pay attention to. Um, probably by far the best strategy in accommodating this field and giving children the opportunities they need is acceleration within a discipline that has no ceilings. Now what do I mean by that? From the time a child begins to show interest in something, and the capacity. Uh, actually, preschool and kindergarten are just great times. Because it's almost like uh, watching a bud in the spring. That's why we give the name of sprouts and our seedlings and sprouts to our three and four year old program. It, the potential's all there. And then you drive home from work one day, and oh my gosh, that's just beautiful. You know, that's, that's the blossoming of of uh, talent. So this, the acceleration in the subject area is to take it from the first starts to blossom and then begin to feed it. How far can it go? What's the ceiling? And you may find out, well, they just have a little bit of interest in mathematics or they just start to learn to read. Or you may find out, my goodness, this little child is ready to read and they're only three years old. No training, no teaching. And off they go. Well, to, to give those opportunities for acceleration, and I wanted to point this book out to you. It's free. If you go online, it's free. It's produced by the University of Iowa, the Bell and Blank Center. Uh, it's a compilation of all the best research in the last 50 years on how to educate gifted kids. And they draw the conclusion the, that acceleration has proven itself over and over again is the best way to address the needs of gifted children. 